Amen. And I'm so glad to be here tonight. Tonight is going to be a great move of the Holy Ghost. I feel direction from the Lord. He, he has made me wait all day. I've been waiting, and he spoke to me during church, and I'm so glad he did because when he doesn't speak to me, I get very nervous, but I'm very, very calm now. Genesis chapter 22, Exodus chapter 17, and Judges chapter 6. Genesis chapter 22, Exodus chapter 17, Judges chapter 6, I honor my sweet, beautiful wife, mother of my three children, and we are so thankful to be here with you in this revival. Ten weeks, and boy, the devil's had a bad time, hasn't he? Amen. Genesis 22, verse 9 to 14. They came to the place which God had told him of. Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand, took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. Abraham went, took the ram, offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. Verse 14 Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh. Somebody say Jehovah-Jireh. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Go to Exodus chapter 17. Sorry for the lengthy reading, but you'll understand in a few minutes why I'm doing this. Exodus 17, verses 13 through, I believe, verse 16. Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Moses said, and God, the Lord said to Moses, write this for a memorial in a book. Rehearse in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Verse 15, and Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi. Somebody say Jehovah Nisi. Or he said, because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek generation to generation. Now go to Judges chapter 6, verses 22 to 24. Judges chapter 6, verse 22 to 24, when Gideon perceived that he was an angel, of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face, the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. Verse 24, And Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom. Somebody say, Jehovah Shalom. And to this day it is yet an Ophrah of the Abiezrites. I want to preach to you tonight or release this to you. Build it, kill it, name it. Build it, kill it, then name it. Turn to your neighbor and say, build it, kill it, and then name it. Lord Jesus, have your way in this house tonight. Thank you for the atmosphere I feel building beneath my feet. I worship you for what you're about to do in this place. Have your way tonight in every situation in Jesus' name. And somebody said amen. You may be seated. We just got invaded by the quiz team. They're bringing trophies. That looks cool. Everything changes at the altar. In the Old Testament, if you were expecting God or needed God to do something, you built an altar before you had an encounter. You didn't just pray and say something, and then he showed up. If you wanted God's attention, you built an altar unto him. You sacrificed some type of animal. You burned it with fire to get God's attention. You had to carry rock after rock after rock. You didn't just get a hold of God immediately. It wasn't some microwave mentality people had when they were ready to sacrifice to God. It was an all-day process of getting the rocks together, getting the wood, getting the animal, slaying the animal, lifting the animal, tying it to the altar, setting it on fire, all kind of things that were extremely difficult. It was very hard work to have an altar. Now today, we come down to a nice prepared altar every service that we just come to and worship the Lord in. But but in the Old Testament, the, the altar was like the prayer life of the New Testament. When you 
built an altar. You were trying to do something beyond the ordinary to get God's attention because some things only change at the altar. You were married at the altar. Your baby was dedicated at the altar. You repented of your sins at the altar. You were filled with the Holy Ghost at the altar. Some of you were healed in this altar. You know about what an altar can do. That's why you can't sit in your pew during an altar call because when you get up in the altar, anything is possible for the situation that you are facing. <laughs> the altar in the Old Testament was priceless because they had to do so much work to get it done. And then they would sacrifice. Prayer that is not sacrificial has no value. I told some people recently that I had, was criticized a lot earlier in ministry because I was big into early morning prayer. It still am. And I believe there's power in early morning prayer. And a lot of people would criticize me and say, there's no difference in praying at 5 a.m. or 5 p.m. or 4 a.m. and 4 p.m. God hears all the prayers, and that is true. But there is one significant difference. One prayer is sacrificial, and the other is not. Most of the time, if you work a normal day job, you are sleeping at 4 a.m. And so to get a prayer up, you've got to get out of the flesh, get away from the fluffy pillows, and find an altar somewhere and say, not my will, but thine be done. That's why that type of prayer has more value. There's more flesh on that altar. <laughs> if your altar has no sacrifice, you will have a difficult time having encounters with God. God looks for sacrificial prayer. You build the altar. You kill the flesh. The flesh has to die for something great to follow. If he truly is going to increase, then I must truly decrease first. And I cannot tap into new spiritual territory with the same amount of flesh that I had yesterday. If I'm, if I'm going to go farther in God today and walk deeper in the spirit, I've got to remove the lust of the flesh the lust of the eye, the pride of life, and step into the spirit so I can hear from God in a deeper dimension. Makes sense. So they would build it. They'd kill a sacrifice. And every once in a while, Bishop, they would name the encounter. They would name, not very often, but every once in a while, when either the sacrifice was so great or the need was so great, when they had the encounter, when they burned the sacrifice, they would say, I'm going to name this moment. I don't want to forget this prayer. You know, sometimes you pray and some church service you have and you can't remember what happened a week later or a month later or a day later. But there are moments, everyone that has a walk with God knows that you can go back in your mind right now to three or four or five times where you had a walk, hold of God in such a way something shifted in a certain prayer meeting or in a certain altar call. Why? Because there was an encounter that was just divinely orchestrated for you. And, and one of the times you find, the first time you find somebody naming an altar you find Abraham and the sacrifice he was tested to give was his son and so God wanted his son to be sacrificed on the altar and so Abraham carries the wood up and they get all the the altar built finally on top of a mountain after a three-day journey and they're exhausted and they're weary and now he takes his 20 year old boy and stretches him out on an altar raises the knife back and God through an angel erupts out of heaven and stops him and says you're okay you passed the test everything you need in the future is yours and Abraham said I'm gonna name this encounter Jehovah Jireh God is my provider watch this and for the rest of Abraham's life he never had to worry about provision ever again because if you build the altar big enough 
Shokataya, and you sacrifice enough, you have a right to name the altar. And God said, I'll be what you need me to be. And Abraham said, I'm believing you to be the provider the rest of my life. Is there anybody in here that needs Jehovah to be Jehovah Jireh in your life right now? I dare you to get a bigger altar. He said, I'm going to call it Jehovah Jireh, and it's there unto this day. In other words, God said, what you say I can be when you pray, when you have the altar, when you sacrifice, I can permanently be what you need me to be with that encounter. And then someone else builds an altar. Joshua and the Israelites are fighting down in the valley and Moses is up in the mountaintop and and as long as Moses had his hand Moses was like Bishop as long as Moses had his hands in the air Joshua and the people won the fight but if Moses hands got tired Joshua and the people lost the fight and so people were up there on the mountain holding up Moses hands Oh, this is going to preach. And they're holding up his hands. And, and, and as his hands are up and lifted, Israel's down the valley winning the battle. And the battle's so real and so severe that when it finally ends and they've got the victory, Moses told Joshua, write this thing down. Write this victory down in a book and tell it to the next generation. In other words, some victories your kids need to know about, mom and dad. Oh, that was cute, but I'm going to... The reason why your kids need to know you struggled and you have victory now is because they're fighting devils that you never fought. And they need a mom and dad to say, you know what? I'm not perfect. I was struggling. I did fall, but God brought me out. And because God brought me out, God's going to bring you out as well. I've got a testimony that you need to hear. I believe where a lot of us are failing, our young people, is we get this per- perfect image set up and they look up and like, well, I can't be like them. They never fail. They never drop the ball. And all I ever do is drop the ball. Everybody in this building has dropped the ball multiple times. If it had no koshata, if it had not been for the mercy and the grace of God, I don't care how long your skirt is. I don't care how nice your suit is, how many verses you can quote, the mercy of God saved you. Somebody ought to praise him for what he brought you out of. If it had not been for the Lord that was on my side. Moses said, oh, this victory is so big, we're going to build an altar. And we're going to name it. We're not going to forget this one. Some revivals come and go. You're not going to forget this one. Some services come and go. You're not going to forget this one. Wait till it's over. Moses said, oh, we're going to name it Jehovah Nisi. God is my banner. You look back in history, you'll see that the armies, the militaries held the flag up at the base, a banner. And if you were out in the battlefield and you were being attacked and you couldn't survive, all you had to do to get back to the base was see the banner raised and go back to the banner. That was your protection. That People think that started in history. That started on a mountaintop when Moses had his hands raised. And when they were down in the valley, they looked up and said, man, my preacher is still with me. That's why you can't skip church and can't get away from your covering because if you because when you're in the heat of the battle and the devil's fighting you you need to know one thing my pastor's praying for me my pastor's covering me you don't know that if you skip every other service Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost on that right now. 
You couldn't pay me enough to skip church all the time. That's insane. You need those hands over you. You're in the valley for a reason. You need that covering. You need that banner. You need that protection. In fact, he's praying for you right now as I'm preaching. You ought to thank God for the bishop's prayers over your family. Some of you are patty caking me like you already had the victory. You had no idea what devils were outside your real estate had they been allowed access on your property. But there was a banner. And Moses said, the Lord is my banner. The Lord is my protector. The Lord is the one that looks over me. Watch this. Oh, this is so powerful. And Moses said, when we wrote it down, God swore to me that I'll have war. I will make war with Amalek from generation to generation. Watch this. He said, because you built an altar and because you said I'm your protection, anytime Amalek tries to come up to fight you, for the rest of the existence of the world. If that country ever tries to attack my people again, I swear to you, because you named the altar, I am your banner, I am your protector, that I will fight them every time. You might get beat by something else, Hoshata, but you're not going to get beat by the thing that's been fighting you all these years. If you, Bukota, if you can get that altar and you can get that sacrifice, you can name that altar. And God said, I swear to you that if that thing ever raises its head again i curse the spirit of fear in the name of jesus the devil's not going to expose you he's not going to destroy you you're covered by the blood i wish someone would recognize the protection you have is real it's not some little thing that you imagine there's a real god with real authority and real power over your circumstance And God permanently became what they named him to be. And then, I'm almost done. Gideon is surrounded by the enemy. Here comes a big old angel. Peace be unto you. Fear not, for thou shalt not die. Now, I'm just, I'm just going to be me. If I hear, peace be unto you, fear not, thou shalt not die. I'm thinking about the thou shalt not die part. Gideon didn't hear that. Gideon heard, peace be unto you. Because he heard it and said, I'm going to build an altar and name it that. Jehovah Shalom. God is the God of my peace. And he said, you are telling me that you're going to give me peace when I'm surrounded by the enemy. I'm not going to have a cute amen altar call, thank you for my word preacher, and go home and forget about it. I'm going to build an altar on that word right now. Here's the reason why some of you lose your peace. You hear the word, but you don't build an altar on the word. Oh, I'm, oh, that was good right there. You get a word, and then you patty cake it, and you come to the altar for seven minutes, and then you wonder why you lose your peace. You've got to build an altar anytime God gives you a word, and you've got to name it. God said, that's not going to take me out. I will not die of cancer. I will not lose my child. I will not go to hell. I've got a word from God, and I've got an altar on it, and it's got a name. He is the God of my peace. Anybody need some peace up in here? Would you build an altar? Would you tell God every day, I'm going to thank you? You shall call his name wonderful. Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. Peace be still. I know the thoughts that I think towards you, and they are thoughts of peace, he said. Now, you may not understand why someone just ran the aisles. 
But when all you've had is war right here and terror and fear and doubt and condemnation and worry and anxiety when you get a word about peace and you hear that it needs an altar on it and you're in the middle of church you don't you bust a move on that to show God if no one else wants that that I'm going to be the one to grab the peace I'm going to be the one to build the altar And the Lord said, and that altar is there unto this day. And it hits me. We used to sing it. Jehovah Jireh, my provider. Jehovah Nisi, Lord, you reign in victory. Jehovah Shiloh or Shalom, my prince of peace. And I worship you because of who you are, okay? It's a song to us. It was an altar to them. The reason why, Hokata, it's a song to you, and all you have to do to get peace is just sing that he's Jehovah Shiloh, my Prince of Peace, because somebody built an altar for you to stand on, Hokataya, that when you're in trouble, you can declare, I can sing about the peace of God. In other words, your sacrifice of today determines your song of tomorrow. What you sacrifice determines how you sing. What you lay down determines what you know can happen. And when you start to say, he's my provider, you didn't do anything. I didn't do anything to call him Jehovah Jireh. Abraham put a kid on an altar. And because of that, thousands of years later, you can walk into Dallas when you have no money. And you can still, Shatiah, you can declare, I'm not going to lose anything. I'm not losing my family because he still is Jehovah Jireh, my provider. And when all hell's breaking loose and you think everything's going to fall apart, you can sing Jehovah Nisi. Lord, you reign in victory. You didn't build that altar. Moses did. But Moses' altar was so big that God lets you sing about it. And you can't save yourself from your sins. But somebody carried a cross to a top of a hill and laid himself on it so that no matter what you were bound by and how low you were. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till at last my trophies I lay down. Aren't you thankful that you didn't have to work your way into your deliverance? Somebody already built the altar for you. If you've got nothing to praise him for except for the fact that he died for you, why don't you do that right now and go back in your mind to how bad the sin was, how low you were, how addicted you were. I need to ask you something, Dad. I need to ask you something, Mom. What are you about to name your altar? Remember, it does no good if there's no sacrifice on it. But if you can sacrifice, you can get that prayer time stirred up. Flesh don't want to fast, but you can put one day a week and say, I'm going to do it anyway. You know what you're telling hell? Building my altar. This isn't for me. This is for Jude and Jet and Jade. 
When on the, on the longest fast I've gone on, every day I've told hell, every day, this is for Jude. This is for Jet. Or this is for Jade. I don't know what they're going to face when they get older. I can't protect them from everything. But if I'm dead and gone, let hell see an altar that this daddy built when those babies were just little. And let them recognize the Holy Ghost on me right now. That no matter what you do to them, he's Jehovah Nisi. He's Jehovah Jireh. He's Jehovah Shalom. He's everything that you need. He'll always be that you need. If you're not already standing, stand to your feet. <sighs> years ago, I don't know why I'm talking about fasting, but years ago I learned a little cool little trick about fasting. That the longer the fast you go on, the longer the list you should make of things you want God to do. And you want to make the biggest list possible. And I can tell you so many stories of crazy things that God did that on the fast I just kept naming it and this sacrifice is going to bring this and this sacrifice is going to bring that I speak it in the name of Jesus I speak it in the name you can just build the altar if you want you can build it and walk away but there's something about building it killing it and then naming it you're letting hell know this is what I really need God to do this is not some just I'm responding altar I am I am being intentional I've got a kid that's lost I've got a situation only God can fix I've got a situation only God I can heal. And let me ask you something. If Isaiah said that when he would be sacrificed, he would see his seed. In other words, when Jesus was on the cross, he said, this is for them. Ah. Uh. Because he knows the power of sacrifice. And if someone does it selflessly, sacrifice has rewards that go out publicly. That can go from generation to generation to generation. I fully believe, Brother Oliver, I believe it. That you can sacrifice and the sacrifice will go down to your boy. I believe it. Years from now, when the devil will try to do something, he'd be protected. Because you were in a service one night and you said, I'm going to build an altar. And I'm naming it God's my son's whatever. God's my son's protector. God's my son's provider. God's my son's warrior. God's my son's he. Whatever the need that you think, you can name it. That oh, I feel the Holy Ghost on me right now. I think I'm giving you a key right now in the spirit. You can build an altar and you can say whatever I need, God's going to be. Well, what do I do to build the altar? Number one, get your prayer life going. Get up tomorrow. Stop making excuses. Even if you wake up late, pray anyway. Do not let days go by without prayer. What you are doing is you're showing hell. I am not building altars. I am unprotected. I am vulnerable. I am weak. But when you build altars. Oh, I can't wait till Wednesday night. When you build altars, you declare I have got something going on with God that you can't stop, hell. It's hurting me right now, but it's going to have a reward at the end of it that I wouldn't trade for anything. Get your prayer life going. And by prayer, I mean praying and reading your Bible. That's, that's prayer. Reading, listening. And remember to fast, start fasting. Start getting yourself in the spirit. Get faithful. Get faithful in every area, ties, church attendance, everything you can be. Start living your life in a way to sacrifice. And here's why. If you'll do it, I promise you as sure as I'm standing here, that some of you, or not all of you, will have a prayer meeting soon. And in that prayer meeting, God will ask you, what do you want? What do you want me to do? What do you want of me? Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. What do you want? 
It's not about fame. It's not about fortune. I don't care if I never preach a message the rest of my life. If my wife and my three little kids go to heaven, let me build the altar. I wish some dads would make up their minds. I'm about to build an altar. My house will be called a house of prayer. My son and daughter may not normally hear me pray, but they're about to hear me pray like, though I wish I could get a mother right now to start agreeing with me that my kids are going to hear me weep in intercession. They're going to hear me travail. They're going to hear me cry out to God. My mother received the Holy Ghost when she was pregnant with me. And she didn't know anything about this. And it scared her to death when she talked in tongues because something spoke to her and said, there's greatness in your womb. And my mom didn't know what that meant. So my mom started having a prayer life like crazy. Didn't know everybody in her family was going to die in a 10-year span. But my mom lived like crazy for God. And my dad reads the Bible. And I'm t- trying to brag about my parents, but it's okay. My dad reads the Bible every 30 days. Has for 39 plus years. 30 days reads the Bible through. Only two days in those 39 years did he not finish his Bible reading for the day. He can quote book after book. It's crazy. I feel backslid around him. But I know one thing. When I come up and preach to a great audience like this and am blessed to come to Dallas First Church, I'm not doing anything on my own altar. I'm standing on altars that my parents built for me. I am no, ah, shut up. I don't deserve to be up here. I fail more than all of you combined. But somebody built an altar and said, that's for my kid's future. And I wish some parents would hear me right now. You have power, more power than you know. But my kid's 45 years old and lost right now. I'd say it's time to build an altar. (laughs) I'd say it's time to show hell. If I die, I'm die praying this prayer. If I die, I'm die saying this one. If I die, I'm dying going out, calling on God with everything in me for that miracle. Head bowed. Eyes closed, head bowed, eyes closed. What do you need your altar to be named? What's the need that if God released it permanently, you'd build the biggest altar possible to get him to do it? You'd live a life of sacrifice. You'd walk in the spirit. What would you do to put down your phone? What would you do to say, i got to get a hold of God. I'll tell you a quick way to find out. Just fast forward 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Oh, whose face are you seeing right now? I call an altar call, but not a normal altar call. An altar building altar call where somebody says to the Lord, no matter what I've got to do, I'm going to do it because there's something that only God can do and I've got to get his attention. So I name my altar, God will save so-and-so. God is my son's deliverer. God is my daughter's healer. God is my spouse's answer. God is my parents' deliverer. The altar is open. It's time to drift near. It's time. I'm about to give it to Bishop, and he's going to lead you in what to do, but I feel the Holy Ghost drawing you right now. What need? What do you need to name it? That means every morning you get up, and when you don't feel like praying, and you're tired, and you're asleep, this is for... This is for this. This is because this need isn't met yet. I don't get up because I want to. I get up because I got kids that need to be saved. I don't get up because I want to. I get up because I have a wife that needs to be saved. I gotta get up. I've got to build an altar. I want you to listen to Bishop. I think he feels something the Holy Ghost. 
Whatever he feels to tell you, I want you to listen to him right now. Now, I did not know he was going to call on me to close this out, but the Holy Ghost spoke to me as he was reading his text. Psalm 46 and 10. Be still and know that I am God. What does be still mean? It means to sink. It means to lay down. It means to abandon. It means to lay aside. So to be still before God means you take away all your doubt. You take away your unbelief. Your worry, your frustration, your anxiety, the pressure, the tension, the stress, you lay it down. You lay down sin. You lay down that which is besieging you and pressuring you and taking you away from God. You lay it down and you are saying, I'm going to be still. I'm submitting to God. I'm bringing everything to God. This is what he's preaching about. You build an altar. And then he said, and no, that means confidence. That means boldness. That means power. That means authority. And so you know, so you speak it then. That which is telling you your kids will never, your husband, your wife, your friends, your life, your health, your wealth. And it just keeps bombarding you, your ministry and such. You know that he is God. And so God is going to raise up. And everybody, it's just what he's talking about. Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Shalom. And you go right on down through all of those eight compounds. And it's power. So what you've got to do, it's not what you want. It's not how you like it. It's not, no, you forget about what friends say, what everybody else would say. And it's just you naked before God. It's you standing with no pretense. It's, you're not hiding it. You can't hide anything from him anyway. But we act like we can. He knows all things. But he said, be still. So you lay all that aside and you stand before God. God and now you're going to know that he is God your kids are going to rise up on what you have built your family is going to rise up on what you have built your ministry your life your business your joy your health your wealth and God's going to bless it but it does not get blessing until you get still I don't care who comes and preaches about all the prosperity and about all the blessings and just be good and be nice and speak all this blessing and just, that doesn't matter nothing. Because every promise in the Bible, every blessing in the Bible is always conditional. He says, if my people will, I will. He's saying, if you will repent, I will fill you with the Holy Ghost. If you'll seek me first, I will add all this other to you. It's always conditional on what we do. So we got to be still. We got to lay it aside. Lay aside every weight and sin which does so easily beset you. So you can run with patience this race that's set before you. So build an altar. Build an altar and let's do it now. Right now, get your mind on what you need to do. I want you to pray for a time and start waking up. Set your alarm clock. And I want you to pray for a plan in every day that you can. And if days are you're tired and weary, but every day, get to that altar. Have a place in your house that hell fears to go near. A spot on the rug place in the office, a chair by the bed, that's your altar. And you show God I'm sacrificing because I've got a kid or I've got a tumor or I've got a situation 
that only you can handle. Would you make a big prayer? Now, we usually think praying big prayers is asking God to do big things. Big prayers to God are commitment prayers. When you start to commit yourself to prayer, don't give prayer unto God. Give yourself unto prayer. That means prayer controls you. That means you don't, you're not your own. Whenever God calls you to the living room floor, you go. That's you're not your own. Would you begin right now to lose control? Take your hands off of the steering wheel of everything going on. And would you surrender right now to God? Would you surrender your mind to God? Would you surrender your thoughts to God? And would you begin to be willing right now? Because the need is that drastic. Would you be willing to do what no one else is willing to do? When others are sleeping, you're going to be praying. When others are eating, you're going to be fasting. When others are watching, movies you're going to be witnessing there's something about you that's different you're not like everybody else you're hungrier and you've got a bigger need than your neighbor does would you get real right now with that altar you might need a bigger altar than what you've been building maybe you're already building it and there you're on your way and maybe you're farther along than someone but if you don't have that consistent prayer life i'm preaching right up your alley right now i'm up in your face right now in the spirit i'm telling you eyeball to eyeball it's time. Stop making excuses. Stop waiting. Stop sitting there. Well, when I get around to it, I'll start praying when I get desperate. You don't want all hell to break loose for you to get desperate. It's time to have a relationship with God that you never dreamed of. I call a prayer meeting now. I release a prayer meeting right now in the atmosphere of this building. Let there be liberty for people to open their mouths and begin to pray in the spirit let there be altars let hell hear the sound of rocks dropping in the spirit let hell hear the sound of flesh dying in the spirit let hell hear the sound of fire crackling in the spirit somebody's gonna get their need met altar call starts now go go go